Good afternoon. <laughs> wow, that sound is so dead. Good, Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, my name is Tracy Jones. I am the Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. <laughs> Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be an illuminating and energizing keynote discussion for our 2020 Annual Alumni of Color Conference. But before we would begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Massachusetts people, and the land on which many of our homes, our schools, and places of work sit are the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. I also recognize the enslaved individuals who helped to build this university and others across the country. Understanding the role that they've played in creating structures of educational institutions that were not intended to serve them. Though acknowledging this history is a small step, it moves us in the direction of ensuring a culture of respect and accountability within our community. So you could just take a moment of silence just to acknowledge that. So to begin, our AOCC keynote is a forum and also the launch of the HGSC's Future of Education series. Throughout 2020, HGSE Centennial Year, we are hosting this series in conjunction with the Ask With Forums. This discussion series will explore challenges and solutions, share new knowledge, and foster constructive conversation about the most important issues in education today. Similar to the Ask With Forums, the Future of Education series will focus on a range of topics that are important today and destined to become more important in the years to come. They include access and equity, immigration, leadership in complex times, the ethics of education, and the power of the arts in education, among many other topics. We are delighted that you have joined us today, here in person and via live stream. We hope you will join us for many other Future of Education forums. Please visit our Centennial website so that you can get the schedule. So now, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for this evening. Heather Watts, sitting right here, is Mohawk and Anishane Nabe, did I say that correctly? Anishinaabe, from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Education has been a central part of her work over the past 10 years, graduating from Syracuse University with a degree in inclusive education, Columbia University Teachers College with a degree in literacy coaching, and she worked as an elementary school teacher in New York City and Rochester, New York. Heather is also a proud and active alum of HGSC. She graduated from the Education Policy and Management Program with her EDM in 2019. And during her time at HGSC, I am proud to say she served as an Equity and Inclusion Fellow, and she was the co-chair of an HGSC student group Future Indigenous Educators Resisting Colonial Education. Some of you may know Fierce. <laughs> Heather was also honored with the 2019 Student Leadership Award presented by the Native American Alumni of Harvard University. Heather is currently a first year doctoral student at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education University of Toronto in the Social Justice Education Program. She serves as an elected member to the OISE Council and sits on the Equity Committee. Her work centers reconciliation and reclamation of indigenous ways of knowing in modern day education systems. Please join me in welcoming Heather and our panelists. Sego sewa kwego, gahantage ne yungats, ganyeke haga nii, waskuleoge. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gahantage, 
which a uh, loose translation means she is in the meadow. My English name is Heather Watts. In Ganya Geha, the Mohawk language. Uh, I am a Haudenosaunee woman from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, and I'm from Bear, the Bear Clan. As we gather together in this incredible space for this very essential conversation, uh, we feel that it is important to set some context. In many indigenous communities, we speak of the teaching of looking forward seven generations, how our actions and how our intentions in the now will impact those faces still to come. This also applies to looking back seven generations honoring those who came before us and their contributions. Our context begins right here at Harvard with the Charter of 1650 by which Harvard continues to be governed by, pledges the university to the education of English and Indian youth. From 1655 to 1698, the Indian College stood in Harvard Yard on the site currently occupied by Matthews Hall. In 1879, the first non-reservation Indian boarding school was founded as Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Many more of these schools would open, with 83% of indigenous children being enrolled in them by 1926. And these schools would remain in operation for another 50 years. In 1968, first tribal college is founded as Navajo Community College. A year later, the Kennedy Report on Indian Education reports that, that uh, Indian education is labeled as a national tragedy, a national challenge, and a recommendation is posed for greater tribal control of own education systems. In 1970, the American Indian Program emerges on campus. That year, the Harvard Graduate School of Education received federal funds for a program to train American Indian leaders, and HGSC enrolled 11 Native Americans to its master's degree program. At that time, the greatest number of Indian students to attend Harvard since the mid-1600s. The American Indian program was housed on, on I should be flipping through these, was housed on um, Hugsey campus in the historical Reed House. In 1975, President Nixon signs the Indian Self-Determination Act, giving tribal governments more authority over education, health, and social services. Years later, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching report deems tribal colleges as underfunded miracles and illustrates how tribal colleges and universities are shaping the future of Native America. In 1990, the American Indian Program was reorganized by the provost as the Harvard University Native American Program, otherwise known as HUNAP. In 1998, HUNAP was designated as an interfaculty initiative of Harvard with goals focused on scholarship and teaching, Native outreach, and student recruitment and support. From 2002 on, many programs have been funded and defunded across the country, partnerships grown, and the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium is established. Now I want to note that while this is not a comprehensive historical representation by any means, um, we feel it's important to set some context for our conversation. And one final note on honoring those who have come before us. Each panelist will introduce themselves and include in that introduction an honoring of a person a body of work, or space from their time in the academy. I will begin by saying Nyawagoa, a big thank you, to my father, Robert Watts, for the example he has always set for me when it comes to education. Being a little girl walking the Harvard campus while my father attended Harvard Kennedy School, I always knew that I too could be here one day. Nyawadad. We're going to get started with introductions with Mr. Tim Begay. Yate, good evening. Buenos dias. 
It's very quiet, and these faces are brown faces, first thing I noticed. Wow. It's, a, it's always great to be back here. It's always enjoyable to see the friends. And one of the first, uh, let me start with uh, saying who I want to acknowledge. Um, many of you probably know Eleanor Duckworth. She's one of the first people that inspired me to come here. I came in the 90s here for a master's program, and uh, I took her course, uh, teaching and learning. And uh, whatever impressions I made upon her, uh, about a year later, she says, Tim, you should come back. And I was like, well, OK, sure, I'll come back. And I did a, a, another master's program. Um, my first one was a APSP, or no, no, they have it the other way around. TCLE, some of you probably know that. Teaching, learning, and uh, this is all foreign to you guys. Uh, <laughs> teaching, learning, curriculum, and learning environments. That was my first degree. And then I came back with APSP. Uh, masters, and that's when uh, Eleanor made this impression upon me. But not, that was not, she was not done with me. She came back uh, again and said, you need to do the next level, which was the EDD. And I, I got that degree in uh, APSP, as it's called. Um, it was called uh, Administration Planning and Social Policy. Some of you probably remember that. So I had a great, um, uh, a great experience here. And uh, I think uh, what's, what's happened to me is that uh, I, didn't, I wouldn't have said that at the time when I was here, that I had a great experience. And I think, I think many of you will learn and probably will agree with me that the longer you spend away from here, the more you begin to appreciate what you have here, what you've got here. And that's what I can say now is that I did appreciate the kind of education that I received here. And I enjoy it. I live on it every day. And so one more person that I want to acknowledge here in the, it's over just across the way at the Kennedy School. Uh, his name is Ronald Heifetz. I was. Uh, I had uh, this impression from. Uh, he impressed upon me his course, the uh, the leadership course, which is uh, I think still there, and uh, I ended up uh, teaching, uh, working with him. And uh, at the end, when I graduated, he was on my committee as well. And when I graduated, he uh, basically said, "Tim, this is your course. You teach it the way you want to teach it, and it's yours now. You go out there and work with it and run with it." So, and I do that, and I did that, and uh, I really enjoyed. Um, that course, I'm learning that course from that course, and I go out there. And um, every now and then, when I'm out there in the larger world doing uh, leadership uh, presentations, I'll get somebody from the audience and say, "That's Ronald Heifetz," and I said, "Yep, that's him." <laughs> <laughs> so what I say and how I say and how I talk, I have, uh, work with my uh, faculty here. That's uh, <clears throat> how I do it, and uh, that's how people recognize Ronald Heifetz. But uh, that's me, and uh, it's in brief, and we'll, you'll hear more from me. And uh, thank you. So, one on Kwe Wani, Wani Nukishkwatong, and Kunibian and Sabatni. Good evening. Um, it's really good to be here with all of you. Um, welcome, and thank you. And thank you, Tracy, for your welcome. I often, um, as akin to this land and the people of this land, as a Natick Nipmuc woman who's both Natick and Massachusetts, um, I really enjoy an acknowledgement that acknowledges this deep relationship between Native people and African descendant people. I want to um, remember or call into the space the Kanabakan, uh, or we know it as the Charles, and it loosely translates to the Windy River. It was a kind of highway, you know, before, and I had the benefit this fall of um, being on a paddle to return our ancestors back home uh, from Deer Island, who were imprisoned there in the King's Phillips War in around 1675-ish. You'll hear me say ish, because you know my numbers aren't always that accurate. I have to look down to see. Um, so we returned them, um, but the Massachusetts, the Massachusetts and Nipmuc, and some other uh, kin from other lands uh, who've been doing this paddle for some years uh, and it was such an honor to come from the ocean into the, into the river, you know, and, um, and have this return home. So uh, it's a special place to me, not just because of that, but whenever things would get too, like, tense for me, I would just take a walk down to the river. So, to botany. Carmen? 
Um, I'm Carmen Lopez. I come from the Navajo Nation. Um, and I'd like to call upon um, all of the, the Native students, administrators, and staff who have come before me and also that are currently here. Uh, I was the former director of HUNAP and um, learned so much from the people of the Eastern Light, um, the Wampanoag, the Nipmuc, the Narragansett here. Um, and I also know that there's a lot of Navajos. This is the East Coast uh, chapter house, that we would say. Um, and um, I'd also like to thank my parents, my, my mother, my father, and my grandparents uh, for, for getting me to this place. And a couple of professors that were really key to me um, in my undergraduate education was Professor Robert Binswanger, who passed away this past year. But I think it was, it was he that really pushed me into education, and in particular, this institution. Um, and there were a lot of other um, Dartmouth undergraduates who came here to Hugsey, and that was important for me in understanding what was it that was going on at this institution that was important to me. Um, but I think when I call upon an alum of a time ago, I think it's Rosemary Christensen, um, who taught me a lot in my time here about that early cohort of the 1970s and the work that they had to do to bring it here. And um, the last group of people I want to acknowledge are the law school students that initiated a lawsuit against Harvard because they weren't fulfilling the obligations of the Charter of 1650. So I think that's something we have to remember as students here, the power that we continue to have in transforming institutions. Uh, if it weren't for those nerdy law school students saying, Harvard is not living up to its obligations, I think we should sue them. They did. Um, and, and things happened because of that seed that was planted that later resulted in AIP, later resulted in HUNAP, later resulted in a large gift to the Native program to be launched by a funder. So we don't realize the power we have as students and what will bear fruit for those of us later down the road. So, so just remember that, and I'm grateful to them. Thank you. Yeah. Diana? Hello everyone. Yad eh. She Diana Uncle Angi and she uh look at the initial na upats on nomina she eight such he needed she na kongi gai kuda she eight sabi in the sky dent na sha. Um so uh, I introduced myself in the the Nebaza in the Navajo language. Um so I just wanted to translate some of that in in English for those of you who don't speak Navajo. Um I am look at the so that's my matrilineal clan. Um that's the Reed People Clan. I'm born for the Comanche people on my father's side. Um, I'm Tkachini, which is the Red Running Into Water Clan. And um, my father is, my father's grandfather is uh, Kiowa from Oklahoma. So um, we, we do those, and, and we've talked a lot um, as a panel amongst ourselves about how we're related, which is really great. It's always nice to find relations when you um, are in spaces. So, um, I do want to acknowledge that those are all my ancestors. I, I try to introduce myself in three different languages because I represent three different tribal nations. Um, I'm not fluent in any of my languages, unfortunately. Um, both my parents were, uh, my mother was fluent and my dad was fluent at some point in, in Kiowa when he was growing up. But um, they, both my parents have both passed on. And uh, so I, I continue on with my education and I'm still working really hard because of the work they put in. And so they're the person that I want to acknowledge in this space. Uh, I grew up first gen, low income background uh, in Norman, Oklahoma. And um, it, was a, it was a difficult life, a lot of different struggles and, and battles that we were all facing. But um, my parents, I think, just seeing and hearing what they went through, they attended um, boarding school at some point and to hear the the constant, um, I guess, pounding down of who they are from society was something that they always impressed upon me and my three siblings about, you know, no matter where you go, 
you know, you need to introduce yourself. You need to introduce all three of your tribal nations, and uh, you bring that with you. So um, I really appreciate them and, the, and everything that they went through for me and my family. Um, I also want to bring to light my brother, Greg. He, he was one of those people in the most pivotal points of my life that, like, was that person that was just like, you deserve better than this, or you, you, I believe in you. And I feel like a lot of times for those of us who, who maybe find solace in, in education um, or in school and comfort there, you just need that one person to tell you, like, I believe in you. And for, for me, that was my brother, Greg. And I just, I really appreciate him and um, all the teachers, too, that created those safe spaces for me when I was growing up. Um, and continue to do that, too. So, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tarjean Yazimintz. I am uh, of the Bitterwater clan, born for the Saltwater clan. And my grandparents are of the Edgewater people, and my paternal grandparents are Red Streak into the water. And in this way, I'm a Navajo woman. I um, grew up uh, in Ganado, Arizona, and uh, grew up in a family of educators. So uh, earlier today, I was thinking about the journey that set me on the path to be here, to have the opportunity to speak. and. It comes from a place of uh, parents believing in education. And uh, my parents were uh, a part of the early cohort of Head Start teachers in our home community. And I think back to the work that they did as the early teachers, as the first cohort of Native teachers that came to our community to teach. Uh, it's, I don't think it's a surprise that I ended up in the field of early childhood education and being a teacher myself. Um, at one point, my mother told me um, that she wasn't surprised because I enrolled myself in Head Start. Um, <laughs> And it's a, it's a funny story because at some point I was sitting um, with my brother playing in the backyard and every day in the, after, in the morning and the afternoon a, a little Head Start bus would come up in the back and kids were getting on and off and they were getting their, their fruit when they get home from, from school. And I've told this story before that the idea of who I became was that person who wanted to get that piece of fruit. And uh, I got on that bus and um, it took me on a, on a life journey to become a teacher, but also a lifelong learner. And that's what I want to bring to our conversation today. When I arrived to Harvard, um, one of the things that I looked for in terms of calling upon the past and thinking about the potential of the future, uh, my mentors in my master's program at Arizona State University were all Native faculty. And it was really um, rare to have Native faculty on your side and help guide your thinking and your research. So they're the ones who um, introduced me to the idea of even thinking about coming to Harvard. Uh, I actually wanted to stay at Arizona State and work on my doctorate there, but they talked about this idea of, of trying something different. Um, but one of the things I did when I first came to campus was to think about the honoring of those that came before me. And one of the scholars who's passed on, his name is um, Dr. Bill Demert. He was one of the first in that cohort that, that um, helped shape the experience here at Harvard and to help me understand that there's a place here for me. Um, I looked for their words in the libraries as well as um, looked for the inspiration to help me go through the program here. The other person I want to call upon in, in our time here is thinking about the future. Um, my colleague Malia Villegas was a student who came after me and I love the idea of thinking about who came before me and then who's coming after me um, and I call upon her and her work. You know, um, we make all these different kinds of decisions about who we are going to be in um, either the academy or in the space of research and inquiry. Uh, and I'm very inspired by the kind of work that she's doing with her community. That home doesn't have to be in the academy, it can be where you take your work. And so that's what I hope to bring to our conversation. 
Right. Well, Nyawa, uh, Nyawa to you all for, for starting us off in, in such a good way and bringing our, our minds together as uh, you all honored um, your relations. And I um, also want to, to honor everyone who is in this room tonight via live stream as well as physically in this space um, as you enter this conversation and, and are in relation uh, with, with all of us this evening. Um, so let's jump right into it, shall we? Okay. Um, so our first question is, uh, what responsibilities do higher education institutions have to the people whose land the physical institution is situated on? Okay. And um, we're going to start off with Tim. We, we talked about uh, coming here and uh, raising this question, how should it be answered? And I kept thinking about that. And so oftentimes I'm thinking that question in the context of what goes on here at this school and how I came here. So the people's whose land that we operate on, I'm thinking, who is it? And uh, most of us here probably don't, are not really aware of that. We don't know or have forgotten, have been ignored. And uh, we continue to live in, in, in the way that we live or the way that we want to operate today. And that's what we do. We never think about like, uh, um, it's kind of like going into your house and me uh, <clears throat> not taking off my shoes and uh, mm -hmm. keeping my hat on and doing all the things that may be a little bit of a foreign concept to you and not acknowledging your norms, social norms for how I should operate in your home. And uh, I don't acknowledge you and I do things the way I want to do. And um, <clears throat> that's what it feels like when, we, uh, when I, I, I think of that, that uh, scenario when I uh, try to answer this question. Because how do we do that? How do we acknowledge the people here? Uh, we don't necessarily do that. And uh, in general, I think higher education doesn't necessarily do that. Higher education has its own cultural ways of uh, inculcating a kind of education that is associated with uh, the Western norms. And, but we don't normally uh, always acknowledge people, the Wampanoag people. This is their land. This is what they have. Uh, the land was probably taken away from them. And so now we think about like, okay, all right, so let's uh, ignore that and continue on. Well, it's, it's, it's like that I would go into your house and ignore your social customs for how you, sh how you want me to operate. And that's what I'm doing when I, when I don't acknowledge our people. And that's how we should do it. But it's how it's created in, uh, in a way that uh, how we create uh, our, our cultural norms here that is in, uh, embedded in academics. And uh, do we ever try to consult some of the folks that, whose land and who we operate on and try to say, where are you from? How do you operate the social norms that they have? No, we don't do that. And we should. And that's something that we should, you know, it's just not acknowledging the people. It's trying to bring them into your house and say, how are, how are things done in your community? And uh, that's how it should be. That's how we, as an institution, should be acknowledging people. And because largely, ultimately, we are forming a community and, and a community that is inclusive. And that's what education is all about, I think. We're forming education that is inclusive of a broader community, bringing everyone into the fold and teaching them in the way that, uh, that they, uh, for, the, for the reasons that they come here. And uh, that's what we do. But we don't, we don't uh, even go down to uh, just a little south of here, the Wampanoag uh, community. There's two of them. There's, even, there's another one further down. Uh, and many of us probably don't even know that. But that's something that you should understand. You should know that. And what are their ways and how do they, they go about life? And uh, I think maybe one or two have uh, graduated from here. But do we ever know them and who they were? And I don't think we ever acknowledge them. I think well, going way back when this institution was created, it was for them that this institution was created. Mm -hmm. But now we've gone on and ignored the rest in the past and move on forward. So I think that's, that's, that's how I would answer that question. It's a, it's a difficult question to answer, but that's what I try to do and come up with. Thank you, Tim. On this idea of acknowledging, uh, first I want to acknowledge that I speak as a Nip Natick Nipmuc. I don't speak for Natick or Nipmuc people, and yet I think it's important uh, to tell my story. Um, that I'm only sharing this in response to my relationship to this land. 
a relationship that my ancestors have had for hundreds and hundreds of years. My hope is that more people, um, in response to this question, that more people of this land would be welcomed and feel welcomed into this space. Um, that I hope that there's an ongoing and engaged discussion of this space, of the people of this land, and the institution's relationship, or the lack thereof, as Tim pointed out, um, between the people of this land and higher education institutions. I'm remembering Karen Mapp's class, Professor Mapp, Dr. Mapp. In her um, Leadership for Social Change class where I met Heather, and we took this class together, one of our first assignments were a TED Talk by novelist Chiamada Adichie, which is called The Danger of a Single Story. In it, she talks about how the single story runs risk of misunderstanding another person, country, and I'll add communities. She also talks about the single story's, um, how it expresses um, how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of that single story. She talks about it particularly as children, but I think this is true for all of us as human beings. I think that institutions of higher education have the responsibility to create more spaces, maybe not as public, but certainly more spaces where people of this land who are indigenous can inquire about themselves while the institution acquires about its history with the people of this land. I also want to talk about something Tim brought up, is like why we forget there are Native people here. I want us to remember a law, the Indian Imprisonment Act law, that was enacted during the King Phillips War in 1675, and it was ended in 2004. That is 329 years of banning not just Indians from Boston, and by then it was a peninsula, you know, they called it Shamit. Um, but also banning the expression of one's indigeneity. So it was not very common, and this is the case with my family, is that people did not identify themselves as Native. And so I think that's something to also kind of inquire about bi-directionally, um, not together, but at the same time. It's a parallel in, in, um, inquiry that institutions have to think about their role in that um, and the people of those institutions, as well as the indigenous people and the impact of that kind of erasure. Okay. Um, for me, uh, it's pretty simple. What do institutions need to do uh, is they need to honor the treaties. That's it. Honor the treaties. <laughs> you, you honor the treaties, you support the self-determination and sovereignty of tribal nations and the communities. That's, that's, these institutions were built upon stolen land and built upon um, slavery, and we have to acknowledge it, and then we have to keep moving uh, forward in what that means. Um, and. And the most important part about um, the honoring of the treaties means that we're reestablishing relationships. So all of our institutions need to be reestablishing, reaffirming relationships with tribal nations. And that might come through some of our, tri our students as well. Um, but the other thing that's really important about this is also cultural humility, that our institutions need to learn to practice cultural humility as an institution. That also is important for us as individuals. Sometimes we want to call the institution something else. We as students in this institution forget that we're a part of it, engaging and perpetuating in colonization or racism or exacerbating poverty and inequity. We have to be careful to not forget that we are a part of that institution as well. And perhaps our job is to help to dismantle it. So we have to practice cultural humility as institutions, as individuals, in terms of our relationship to those local tribes and nations that, that are there. Um, and I think that the, the, the other part um, is for our institutions to acknowledge the, um, the poverty, and the policies in place that perpetuate inequity. Um, we have to recognize that our institutions are complicit in it, 
And then we've got to work to undermining that inequity. Um, this is the big work that we have to do. And sometimes as students, you have a piece and a role to play within that. And then as organizations, those of us that are, are, are now out in the world doing the work, we're also engaged with that. In my College Horizons program, I, it's a college access uh, program that works and partners with about 75 different colleges and universities. Um, I'm working with one institution right now that is engaging in this work. They were founded at the time of Indian removal, and all of those students were removed off of the land. So today they're thinking about, they're not here anymore. Who are we supposed to call upon? And, and we're saying, you need to bring those students back to their homelands. You welcome them back to this place that their ancestors are from. Uh, it's really hard work to do, but that's part of the relationships that we're trying to develop with tribal nations. So we have to remember the relationality of our institutions. And the basic, most fundamental is we need to honor the treaties. <laughs> I really appreciate uh, bringing in treaty, because I think it's something that we often forget about. Um, and they are the original agreements of, of this territory. And we are all treaty people and are implicated by the agreements made in treaty. And um, right when, when treaties are, are negotiated and agreed upon, um, they're done so on a nation to nation basis, right? And not this kind of like pan indigenous uh, basis. So um, thinking of institutions of higher education also honoring that sentiment. Right, and relating to people on, on a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, basis, I think is something that's really important to, to remember. Um, all right, let's jump into the second question. Um, how can higher education institutions create honorable and meaningful relationships with indigenous communities and individuals? And we'll start with Tara Jane. Great, great. Inherent in that question is that um, we can guess that that doesn't happen that often. <laughs> um, and there, there isn't quite a menu for, for how we go about, um, as institutions, how uh, institutions of higher ed reach out or, or get connected with, with tribal communities. Um, one of the things that I have utilized in my own work as um, a Native researcher is I have made myself visible in the work that needs to be done, and then I wait for the invitation. And part of that is important to me in the work, um, as I was a, a person who was representing higher ed institutions as a researcher and as a faculty member, um, I knew I had two sort of, I did two maybe conflicting identities. One in which you're representing this predominantly white institution and all of its systems and all of what it stands for. And on the other side, you're representing um, everything that you've been brought up to, to right. be and to how to uh, behave and, and comport yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, those two things didn't sit well together in the space of, of being in the academy. Um, but, but, the, but the work that needs to be done needs to happen on both sides. That's something that I've learned over time in terms of thinking about the relationship and, and being an honorable and meaningful relationship is that it has to go both ways. Uh, so there is a word out there that is called reciprocity. Um, we can engage in reciprocal uh, development of relationship, of ideas, of the journey of the research question. And I think that that's something that is oftentimes hard for people who are very, um, have their direct understanding of what they need to ask in terms of a question or scientific inquiry. Uh, but it needs to come from both sides. One thing that I've struggled with in terms of looking at the work that happens across Native communities and research in particular is often the questions come from outside. I've, been, have the, uh, I've had the luxury of now working on the other side with communities to help build their own inquiry around what they want to do, what they want to answer, and how they want to answer those questions. 
it's possible to do. And it's been one of my career tests is to figure out how do we do this so that institutions can systematize how to go about this work so that we do it in an honorable way, so that we have protocols that we can call upon in order to create those relationships with tribal nations and tribal communities. Uh, that's been a very uh, important area of work, uh, but that the definition of relationship is critical and it's acknowledging both the past and those systems that have effectively erased our communities from the conversation. Uh, but there is some really amazing work going on in Indian country, uh, not just by scholars from the academy, but those you know parents and families and children starting to ask questions and starting to think about how do we change this dynamic so that we are in control of knowledge creation for our communities so that we can restore um, something that Carmen and I were talking today about is this idea of restoring balance mm -hmm. in our communities. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the conversation that comes from the academy can be, um, uh, I, the, the right word is not this, but I'm going <laughs> to say it. Uh, it can be destructive mm -hmm. to the forward movement of what needs to happen in our communities. And so there's a, there's a very delicate balance between asking the question, figuring out how you answer it, and then the purpose for which we're engaged in that. And higher ed institutions have a real critical role in examining those processes and supporting faculty in, in being innovators in the work that they're engaged in as scholars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, it's a really, it's a tough question. I agree with her, Regina. It's because it's, there's been so much damage done between institutions mm -hmm. of higher ed and tribal nations. Um, I did my undergrad and my master's work at, um, in Arizona, so I'm thinking about a lot of those examples when I'm trying to answer this question. And um, I think it involves in, um, institutions of higher ed and the leaders going out to these communities and um, creating and being there, like just sort of just being in those, in those spaces to learn or to listen. And um, I think a lot of that is gonna include people um, thinking really deeply with what those leaders are saying about um, maybe what issues are fa facing those communities to help solve those issues. Um, not to come in to, to answer and, and try to like put a band-aid on a solution, but um, you know, institutions of higher ed have access to a lot of resources mm -hmm. and if they can create spaces for indigenous scholars um, to lift up their, their forms of knowledge and their, their ways of um, thinking that um, I think that universities and colleges could, could definitely play a role in working with tribes in those ways. Um, I'm also thinking about the way that, and, and in Arizona, and I know there's, there's some in across the country um, in the lower 48 or in other, in, um, in Alaska perhaps, but there are tribal colleges and universities. And um, in order to create this honorable relationship, I think we, we could do a better job at making sure that students who are attending those tribal colleges and universities are having a more seamless transition into going into a, a four-year uh, university. I think that we're, we're not doing um, a lot of the good work that could be happening in making sure that those who are graduating uh, from a tribal college are making it successfully in completing their, um, their four-year degree. And so I think that institutions of higher ed could play a bigger role in those conversations. And, um, and in thinking about that, because institutions of higher education, they, they're producing, they're doing a lot of research, they're producing a lot of things. And one of the things that I know we've talked about and I've mentioned a few times is in my master's work and in my doctoral work, I had the privilege of being able to go through two different cycles of a tribal IRB. Mm -hmm. And not a lot of institutions have tribal IRBs <laughs> and it's something that I feel really passionate about um, in that we have, like I said, tribes have been burned a lot and in Arizona, that's very true for, um, for Arizona State and the, the, the big struggle that they had with the Havasupai tribe. Um, sending in a researcher who is non-native and someone who was doing unethical work and used uh, blood samples in a, in a way that was not what they had intended to do. And so tribes are very distrustful of researchers and a lot of these researchers are getting grants and millions and millions of dollars and a lot of that money tribes and communities never see. 
or they never see the results of it. Um, and the language is never perhaps translated. It's not going to be in Hopi. It's not going to be in Navajo. It's, it's going to be in English, and it's going to be with academic language. And so who's getting access to these uh, reports and who's hearing them, I think, is a really important question. And so I'm really hoping that uh, institutions of higher ed, um, more specifically the Ivies, right, because I work at Yale, and um, pushing this conversation of how are we working harder to make sure people who are getting their degrees off of our history and like anthropologists, archaeologists, um, how are they ethically going through those processes of doing their research and working with the tribal communities so that the people that they're affecting um, are actually benefiting from this research or and doing it hand in hand with them? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I want to thank um, Diana and Tarjean for your very concrete examples. Um, and I think for me, when I think about this question, I think it's really important to define what honorable relationship is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to respond to that piece of the question. Um, so some 10 years ago, a roommate of mine introduced me to Adrian Rich's book on secret lies and silence. And I read it um, in the way I knew how, which was like over and over again, writing in the margins, a book full of nine notes. <laughs> and in it, she wrote this um, piece called Notes on Lying, where she speaks about honorable relationship, I think it can be helpful for us um, when we talk about um, institutions of higher ed creating honorable relationships with indigenous communities and individuals. She says, quote, um, an honorable relationship is one which two people, I'll insert two communities or two institutions, have the right the, to use the word love. And she goes on to say, and a process of refining the truths they can tell each other. Uh, so for me, uh, this is really important to come from a place of love uh, when you're in any relationship. And um, when we can't come from that place or we get lost from that place, I think that's a place we should go back to when we're having relationships community to community, individual to individual. I think the institutions of higher education needs to do the work of not just defining what love means in relationship to indigenous people and communities, but also centering that in their relationship building or repairing. I want to define what I mean by love by saying that it's the practices, specifically the methods, the pedagogies, but also the structures that center sovereignty of indigenous bodies, peoples, and communities. I think once we do that, you can begin to the other part of the honorable relationship, which is refining the truths, really peeling back the truths, both historical and present, um, to create a different type of future um, where indigenous people have their sovereignty. Yeah. I think it's really important, like bringing up this um, concept of relationality in terms of responsibilities of institutions of higher ed, as what in, in relation to research specifically. Um, I'm what this is bringing up for me is the work of Dr. Eve Tuck, um, and an article she has about damage-centered research and how oftentimes when we're researching indigenous communities is very much like in the realm of damage centered. Um, and like specifically also from the lens of being an indigenous research, right? And, and something in, in her article, and I quote is, can you go home after you finish your dissertation? Um, and that's something as a doctoral student I am constantly um, thinking through um, in, in terms of how I want to approach uh, my community where there's so much genius and so much innovation and so much knowledge. Um, and, and that's what we want to uplift, right? Um, not, not the things that have been reproduced and the statistics and the, you know, the trauma that, that is just the common narrative of indigenous communities. Um, so I just really appreciate um, all three of you um, bringing up that concept of, of relationality and uh, responsibility of institutions. So moving along. Uh, how do we talk to students about their place in the academy when the very creation of the institution was not made for their inclusion? I'm going to start with Tim. <laughs> um. With the exception of Harvard. Harvard was established. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Harvard was established to educate Indians. Mm -hmm. Remember that. And the, another school just to the north of us was created just for that very purpose. And there are many other schools that were have a historical past that were devoted entirely to educating Indians or native kids. Um, that's the background, and, and uh, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to nicely answer this question uh, <laughs> without having to sound like I'm, on, I'm angry or anything like that. Uh, but um, it is. We give you permission. You <laughs> say, <laughs> angry. But, but this is the place. You know? This is the place. It's always been the place for me to say that stuff. So, um, <clears throat> um, I think one of the things that it's always uh, difficult to convey to Native kids who want to come here, and this is something that I talked about today with some students who are sitting here who may come to come here. And uh, <clears throat> I think one of the things that uh, is, is the really difficult challenge is that when you come here, or when you're planning to come here, you're, you're thinking of this place called Harvard that everybody wants to talk about. It's a place where, uh, let me give you an example. I was in Alaska on a, getting on a ferry, uh, coming back down here one summer, and uh, it's, uh, sat near, near these uh, older couple uh, older white couple, and uh, they, they ignored me. I ignored them for a while until one of them finally came over and said, oh, started talking to me and, uh, and asked me what I did. I teach, and, uh, and he goes, where are you from? Where do you teach? And it came down to, I live in Boston, and I teach there. And, uh, and uh, he, he was saying, uh, where did you go to school? And, you know, and I had to reveal the H name. <laughs> but as soon as I said that, he turns and he's just up straight and says, so tell me, what do you think about President Bill Clinton's policy on foreign policy in the Middle East? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's what comes with, there's the kind of uh, broader expectations that, you, that it comes with the name Harvard attached to uh, your name and uh, any sort of affiliation with that. And that's what, one of the things that I always uh, talk about uh, when it comes to students who are interested in Harvard, because as soon as you hear the word Harvard, it becomes suddenly this uh, huge, gigantic baggage you have to carry, uh, the expectations that come with it. And, uh, and again, one quick example is uh, as soon as I left my community, my home community, to come here, um, the expectations about who I am changed. And I go back into my community, and uh, one of the first comments that I remember hearing is, so, you think you're better than us now? <laughs> I said, did I think that? No, I don't, I didn't, I don't remember saying that, but uh, I, it, I didn't think I was any better than uh, I, th I thought I knew more. I not met more people out there in the larger world and, mm -hmm. and uh, learned about all the opportunities that were uh, available to me is upon graduating from here. And so when I talk to students, it's really about, I think, uh, at least for native communities, because I, I'm familiar with many of the native communities that I visited out there. It's much more uh, brittle, brittle uh, communities that they come from, but very strong in traditions and culture that is not uh, exactly uh, understood here at this ac academic institution. Not, it's not, not just here, but in all uh, higher ed institutions. It's not always understood, so you have to be careful, I think, in terms of uh, how you convey the what uh, Harvard can do for you and uh, how it can move you forward into the larger world because um, and the bottom line for me has always been that the, that the name Harvard has always uh, th these great connotations to it but it also has that negative side because it comes with this uh, you know, baggage as I call it and uh, so you have to learn how to balance those those two when it comes to uh, uh, when, I t when I talk to students, it's always about, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to Harvard. And I've seen students here that I remember uh, my first year here, uh, my fellow uh, students, first year students were all, I can't believe I'm at Harvard. I can't believe I'm at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So, oh, really? Okay. So, and then comes the question, why did you come to Harvard? And I think my, my answer has always been, um, I didn't go to Harvard because it was Harvard. I, I went to Harvard because it was there in my way. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that, long, uh, uh, that I have done that, that was in my way, and Harvard was one of them. But I, I learned that I could take what I can from here and, and uh, meet new people, great, great opportunities that came up for me, and uh, I took advantage of that, and I'm, and I'm glad I did. And uh, I thank everybody that uh, educated me here and people that I work with and I, I uh, got to meet, and I thank all of them. But it's also a kind of a cautionary kind of thank you because 
you know, again, the, the traditions and the cultures in which I come here with is not always part of what is the, the norm here. Mm -hmm. So I have to learn how to adjust and learn how to adapt. And that's what I tell students when they come here, native students who are interested here. And, uh, and that's not, not necessarily limited to native students, I think. And uh, the earlier discussion when we talk about people of color, that's true to all people of color. You come here into this environment. and. Uh, and it's always not uh, considerate or inclusive of your culture and where you come from. But it's, it's uh, something that where we all have to adopt. And that's part of life, though. I think we all have to adopt and adjust to how we want to go live life. And uh, now that Harvard has been in my path and I put it behind me, I'm moving forward with this. And uh, I'm thankful and I'm grateful for all that. And that's how I try to convey my message to people around me and people that I meet across out there in the larger world. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> How many here are are looking at a program, whether it's Harvard or, or somewhere else? Can I just see a show of hands that, of those who are prospective students to some institution out there? Can I see who's looking? Who's looking? Okay. So I'm, I'm, my comments are going to be directed to those of you who are looking. Okay. Um, this is how I would love institutions to speak to students who are from indigenous backgrounds, but also just any student. Um, I want you to speak, I want institutions and, and the people who represent those institutions, I want them to speak with students from the position of being a teacher. Um, and I want them to be um, what uh, one of the early uh, influencers on my work on teachers um, wrote about uh, Kleinfeld, Judith Kleinfeld, talked about the warm demander. I want people to have a warm demanding of you who are considering going into the field, if it's education and if it's another field, but that they're demanding excellence from you. Mm. And that you learn how to define what that means for you. So when I think about the work within the field of education, I think about um, how much we desperately need teachers who have a deep compassion and a deep love for learning and teaching. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the element for me that, that's gonna carve you a space in any institution that you're looking to be a part of. One of the statements I made when I was applying to Harvard, and, and I say it from that position of power, I want to emphasize that. When I applied to come to this institution, it was from a position of power. I knew I was gonna be bringing something to this institution that was going to be, um, it was going to be an asset to the institution be it my color of skin or the way in which I um, move in the space, I was gonna be bringing something. And therefore, I treated the situation as um, I am interviewing the institution. Mm -hmm. I wanna know if it can handle Tarjina. Yeah. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> that was the question That's I kept great. asking myself. It wasn't whether or not the institution was gonna accept me, yeah. but is it, able to help me answer the questions that I know our communities desperately need to answer. And is this the place for that conversation? Mm -hmm. And um, I t I've spoken to many prospective students over the years, both while here and in my role as a faculty member. And the question I often ask them is, why do you, what do you wanna do when you, when you leave here? How do you wanna com communicate or, or help your own community answer their questions? What does that look like for you? Because if you have that deep understanding of commitment and responsibility, then the, you, I don't think you'll ever use the term, and I've heard this used by students, the blood, sweat, and tears. Mm -hmm. There's no blood, there's no sweat, there's no tears in that conversation around exemplary work is that you've committed and you've decided to um, be responsible mm -hmm. for, the co for the contributions that you're going to bring back to your community. And that's the warm demandingness that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not, a, it's not a, 
uh, easy conversation to have with somebody who's really trying to decide, is this the right thing for them? Mm -hmm. And in some cases, I've been a part of conversations about helping people make the decision to leave. Mm -hmm. To leave this institution, but to go back to their community because they have the one lifetime opportunity to change it and to restore their language in their community, then yes, I'm on that side. Mm -hmm. So these are really um, important conversations as we think about the access to education, we have to be able to have that real truthful conversation about how are you going to design the kind of education you want from the institution that you're going into. When I was here, I developed my own plan for some of the courses because it wasn't reflecting what I needed to know. So I did a special uh, proposal to do my history requirement on the history of native early childhood education. And I looked for all the scholars out there in the field and I spoke with them about this work. Um, when I presented my dissertation committee, I required them to consider bringing on a native scholar. And I think I was the first to bring on a native scholar from outside Harvard. We went through a process of, of proposing that and getting them a legitimate space on my committee so that I could have somebody that I could count on to really hold me, hold my feet to the fire around the work because it couldn't be less than exemplary, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's what we want in this endeavor. Mm -hmm. And so there's some, yes, I understand that there's, there's that other story where we feel like we're not belonging, we feel that we don't have what we need. But we have to become those educators that have to pave the path, and it's not always easy. I go back to thinking about um, the work we did up in, um, in uh, Alaska, in the Arctic Circle, and they talk about this work of being back-breaking trail work. They're breaking the trail so that they can feed their community. And that's what we are, all of us in this room. When, I, when Tim said, oh my gosh, all of his brown faces, this is not what Harvard looked like when I was here. <laughs> and we didn't have a panel like this. I would have you know, protested so much to get uh, 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 native scholars to come to Harvard and we'd get one every couple of years. Uh, this is uncommon for us to have this opportunity and to be able to demand excellence from the work of those coming after us and those who are going back to our community and working with us. We have to be in that space of that warm demander. Mm -hmm. So it's not always, I don't always deliver the easy news to people, uh, <laughs> but that's, that's the, the position that I've been growing in. And that's what I held myself to when I was here. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think before I lose this thought, building off of Tara Jean, my, my when the institution is not created for for us as students, the you in this room in particular, you need to go create those institutions outside of higher education. Um, that's where we catch the students. That's where we hold them up. So don't underestimate the power, I would tell you all, go create your own nonprofits or your NGOs. That's what I'm doing now. So, so I've seen it and I've done it. Having been here as a student, having been here as an administrator, I was just gobbling up tools, knowledge, excellence, always thinking about how am I gonna apply this uh, in the community, how am I going to go back into community? How am I c connecting theory and praxis? That is my work. And and when I was here and decided to leave an administrative position, people, colleagues here thought I was crazy. They thought I gave up a position that I could retire in. But that was never my goal when I took that position. I knew I was going to leave because because this institution was getting the best of me. And I thought, don't Native students deserve the best of yes. who I am? Mm -hmm. So yes. 
that's that's the excellence part. And and so don't forget, you you have the power to go create the institutions that our students and communities need once you leave here or do it while you're here, actually. That was one of the biggest things I think Eileen De Los Reyes's class taught us is she, she told us, what are you going to do here? You're talking about what you're going to do when you leave, but can you make the change while you're here? So that's the education for social political change to think about. The other thing I want to say around this, I'm going to take us to affirmative action um, because it's, 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 we got to talk about affirmative action. Um, <laughs> this is what affirmative action said after civil rights. It says that the institutions are dysfunctional. The institutions are deficient. Not women who weren't in those colleges, not African Americans who weren't in those colleges, not Latinos, not LGBTQ, not any of us. We're not the ones that are deficient and lacking. It is the institutions that are. So we have to re, we have to change. It's not even changing the narrative. It was there. It got changed, internalized that you are not deficient. The institution is and go from there. Don't let this other narrative change um, make you think that you shouldn't be at these institutions because they need us here. Um, so, so that's really foundational, I think, for students to understand that they're, uh, that they're here and they're, uh, uh, because of their own merits and because they have things to contribute to the institution. Um, the other thing I want to say about this, um, I, I'm really in this space of transformation and transformational power. Uh, and I see a lot of the work that I do with both the students in my group and the faculty in my organization around transformation. And, Here's the work that has to happen in, in higher ed, especially when I'm thinking about um, anti-racism work um, or white privilege or white supremacy. All of that work is deeply personal and deeply emotional. We try to intellectualize the change to be anti-racist. We think is trainings that we go to, if I am, implement X, Y, and Z, my institution, or I will become better at it. It is not that. The work of anti-racism is about me sitting down with you talking story. I need to share my experiences. I need to hear yours. And we need to struggle in understanding our experiences. It is individual and emotional work that has to take place. And, and when I hear your story, I'm going to be changed. I'm not going to see you the same way anymore. And that's the part that takes the time for all of us to do in our spaces. So it's what's difficult is in our institution, at the same time as it's being racist to us, we're trying to ask it, ask it to also not be racist. It's putting it both at the same time. Um, you're doing the work at the same time. Now, what happens a lot of times is students of color have to bear the teaching of that, and it's tiring. I know it's tiring. And I'm going to tell you, 20 years later, I'm still doing the work. And, and I've come to accept it, actually. But I, I get tired of it, and then I've got to go refill my bucket. I've got to be with awesome people. I need to get inspired again. I need to fill myself up so I can do the work again. Um, and anti-racism work is a lifelong work for our country. We have 500 years of colonization for indigenous people that needs to continue to be healed. And it's a life's journey's work. And there were times where I wasn't ready for that. I didn't want to hear that. I mean, I have three children now, and I want it to be better for them so that they don't have to deal with it. But guess what? It is, um, it is the journey of our nation that we will engage in this work always. And guess what? I come from a tradition of Navajo peoples who have the same stories about chaos, mm -hmm. about destruction, about monsters, about enemies that come to us. Mm -hmm. And I have stories within those traditions that talk about the medicine, the healing, the twin warriors, and um, the answers are there. They have taught us this over and over how to overcome this type of, of um, dysfunction. So 
You know, one of the things that I, I, I think about a lot recently was um, a Hawaiian elder who opened our program. She reminded us, she said, uh, we talk about generational trauma, but don't forget we have ancestral stamina. Yes. Right? Isn't that the best? I mean, and so come back to that, all of us. Come back to that ancestral stamina to remember that the stories have already been laid out. The answers and the healings are already there. We have to come back to that way of knowing, way of being, acknowledge it for us to go forward. So for students, you, that's the place to tap into. And that's what was built. I mean, the, the, the Alumni of Color Conference comes out of that space. Yes. It exists because people took action to create a space for this conversation that did not exist before. That's the kind of change that can happen in higher education, but it does have to come from the needs of those who are here at the moment, mm -hmm. and it evolves. It evolves over time, and that's one of the wonderful things about you know, having to, I, I, I think years ago, um, you know, I sat on the, the teaching community of the T128 class, mm -hmm. which is what Carmen just referred to. And to see um, AOCC grow mm -hmm. to an institutionalized um, conference and to be expanded to invite others who didn't go to Harvard, to expand it to others to come here and to have, to create that space of joining and thinking and um, getting to engage in intellectual discussion about the work, right? That's what people were dreaming about almost 20 years ago. And you get to get the fruits of that labor. It's amazing to see uh, a space like this now. And you then have to pay that back. Mm -hmm. Figure out how to make sure that you're finding uh, a way to contribute to the sustainability of the work, not just here, but if you're not from here, take it back to your institution and fight hard. Somebody is coming behind you and they're awesome. Mm -hmm. So you gotta work hard for them, whether it's your own children or you know, as a teacher, you're looking at your students and they have the most amazing aspiration to teach the next generation. That's what we're doing. That's what we want to see. So work hard at it. Don't give up. <laughs> and as a student, this is your time. This is your opportunity. And the place where you're going to do it, it is here. And how are you going to do it? You have a faculty here that's open and willing to hear you out. And that's, this is the time, the time to do that, to share your passion, put it out there. And that's what I say to the native, potential Native students who want to come here. This is the time to do it, and this is the place to do it, and this is where the faculty will allow you to do that. And that's what I learned. This is where we are able to make these changes, and we, we stood for, we were for our passions, and it was played out, and we were allowed to play it out. And I think many of the uh, former students here will allow agree with me on that and this is the place to do it and this is the time to do it and if you're a student here you only have nine months to do it <laughs> <laughs> For some of you, but you got to do it now Stop. nowhere in the world are you going to get another opportunity such as this in the place and the opportunity yeah Diana? Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot I feel like I can add because those are some amazing um, just ideas coming out of all of these these scholars here and I'm just so um, and I'm like looking at you and just like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm not an alum of Harvard, but I um, am just like so glad that I get invited to a space like this to talk more about um, what we've all, what we've done and where we're going. But um, I think the only thing I would add is just thinking about this, uh, this dangerous narrative of like, hire it as the only way. Mm -hmm. um, so challenging that for our students because they're they're really weighing themselves and, and, and measuring themselves up to, can I do this? This is like how people succeed, right? This is leadership in action is going through a higher education and getting, you know, a degree of some sort. Um, so I think for students who are feeling like this is a place that is not fitting for them, and, and we've mentioned that uh, because these places aren't designed for us, that we see, we see that and then we see ourselves as failures. Um, but I think students um, in, from indigenous communities specifically, they, they will often think about how it's, one, it's like an either or sometimes. It's, it's like you either go to school or you're going to be staying here. But 
it's also like like Tim said, it's a beautiful thing to stay home. It's a beautiful thing to to learn your language or to to take on some of the tasks that people need at home. And so, um, a leader isn't always going to be someone that's wearing a suit, right, mm -hmm. and a tie. It's going to be someone who um, is in your community and doing some really good things and carry on a lot of the the traditions that are happening there. And so, I think that we have to be those reminders in spaces of higher education or whatever places we're, we're working with students that we're always letting them know that you know you shouldn't be weighing yourself in in this societal norm of like going to college is how you are going to be successful in life so um that's just the only thing that i'll add to all these amazing comments here yeah. right so our final question of the evening which we're going to hear from all the panelists um, what current or future work are you hopeful will make an impact for Indigenous scholars. And uh, we're going to start off with Sadata. Uh, first, I want to say, Carmen, thank you for uh, teaching me or correcting me and pronouncing Tara Jean's name. And I'm sorry <laughs> that I mispronounced it. So I'm most hopeful um, about two things uh, in um, Indigenous, for indigenous scholars or indigenous scholarship, or, and I'll even add like work with indigenous communities. Um, one is trauma-centered work, uh, and I'll add what Carmen is saying um, that the Hawaiian elder <laughs> taught her about this kind of ancestral um, kind of resilience as well, you know, that those things are hand in hand, um, and the complexity of what it means to be indigenous. Um, and the trauma-centered work for me is uh, practices and structures that are centered in what we know about the lived um, impact of trauma on indigenous and marginalized bodies. And for it to be complex, I go back to this idea of a single story, that it's layered, uh, what it looks like, um, how people choose to be and identify themselves as indigenous people or bodies um, differs. You know, So it's not, it's, it's not just a single story about that. Um, and I think about Joe Gahn's uh, class, Professor Gahn, Dr. Gahn, um, his counseling and colonization question mark class. Um, and we learned about uh, these alternative cultural and spiritual approaches to healing trauma and the possibilities that they offer for healing in indigenous communities. Uh, this is not the only way, but I think it's an example of how indigenous culture can offer a trauma-centered approach to healing and engaging uh, indigenous communities. Um, I think other fields like education can learn from this. I also think about Diane Moore's work um, in religious literacy and might offer a kind of a template to do what Kim Tallbear talks about um, to soften the boundaries between indigenous communities and scholars. She talks about it, those who are the knowledge bearers and um, those who kind of inquire about um, the knowledge which would be scholars. Um, this could lead to, I think, what Tall Bear talks about, which is a democratic knowledge production. The knowledge production doesn't just happen at the institution, and it's not just valued because it happens there, um, but it's valued also because it happens in indigenous communities, and it happens there. Yeah, I, I have two things I'm hopeful for, um, for the work ahead. One is I am ready to embark on the next uh, phase of work, which is to really amplify the uh, communities engaged in community inquiry. I think that that's a place where we can begin to design and to think through uh, holistic systems from prenatal all the way to elderhood. And particularly for Native communities, I think it's an opportunity to be visionary as well as a worker bee. Mm -hmm. I've always found myself to be a worker bee, and um, I'll pick up the trash and feed people when they need to think about how to solve the biggest problems in our communities. Mm -hmm. I um, don't have a problem with the, the idea of being a very strong host for thinking about the, the biggest uh, issues that our communities are facing. But I also think about the role that I can play in terms of helping bring tools and resources uh, in ways that might help us answer some of these questions around 
um, it could be diabetes, it could be about um, families um, reuniting fathers with their children. Um, there's these kinds of questions that our communities are thinking about, um, and we can learn from other other work that's going on that's at the community level, and and that's the space that that I really think can, we can thrive in terms of the work ahead. So I'm very hopeful for that. Uh, and my one advice for those of you out there is no matter where you find yourself, whether you're in the academy or you're in community, decide to be both of those things, right? Be a worker bee and be visionary. Make sure you find a way to be that visionary because you will not see why the small tasks that you're engaged in are a part of a bigger plan. So know the plan, be visionary, and be a worker bee. Get to work, get it done. <laughs> Tim? Um, let, me, let me just say to the current students, all students here, you are the current work. You are the one who's gonna do the work. The work of, that's an almost an impossible task, but you're the one who's gonna have to go out there once you have gathered all this knowledge and make it, make Harvard work for you. The work that you will, uh, that I'm hope, always hopeful of is that, and the investment that we have in you, the student, the, you, the student out there where I work, the native students, that's our investment. And the faculty here putting, are putting their investment in you. And this is where you're going to shine. You're the one who has taken on this burden of putting yourself on the line, putting yourself in the bullseye, because you're the one who is going to have to publish. You're the one who is going to have to put your neck out there as a principal, as a school leader, and make things happen because once you start to do that, you're the one who's gonna be the target. You're the one who's gonna be criticized. You're the one who's gonna have to prove yourself. You're gonna be the one who has to has the stamina. You're the one who's gonna have to have a, a, a backbone that can we can all rest on because that's, you're the person, that's the investment. And, that's, and then your work, especially if you're native in your native community, uh, research, this thing called research has one that's been uh, been frowned, up, frowned upon because historically researchers coming to native communities have always taken that information away, mm -hmm. taken, stripped that part of the community that was so valuable, the sacred pieces that have been left out there. And many of them um, you'll find if you just go down to the museum over here the artifacts of what has been taken from Native communities. It's still there. Bones of people. And it's a creepy place, actually. I don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. But it's, uh, it's something that is, uh, it happens. And that, but you're the person, you're the one, as a researcher, you're going to have to sit out there and put things to, put yourself to work and make things happen. Do the right thing. Do. Uh, Take the wrong and put it in the right place. And that's your job now. But you're the one who's going to have to be the native researcher going into a native community and figuring out how am I going to do this. Because now you are in the place of that outside white researcher. You are that person. You have learned the tools of that white person who was coming into these communities. You are now that person but you are now native. You know how to do this because you are part of that community. You know what the sensitivities are, what the social cultural expectations of the community are, and you know how to do that. So that's where I see you, the student, and it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what color you are, it's you are the student. You are the ones who are gonna be making the changes as soon as you leave this community, in your communities. It goes everywhere, and I know Harvard students are everywhere. Everywhere you go, they're there. But you, they are gonna make the changes. You will also be joining that group. And that's all. Yeah. Carmen? Okay. Um, when I'm thinking about hopefulness, um, I love, Futurism, writing, indigenous futurism, 
um, Afro-African American futurism. I, I love the idea of what's in the future. And um, Adrian Keene has talked about this uh, in her lectures as well. And I'm also like a sci-fi dystopian <laughs> Star Wars big fan. And so I think about that a lot of what does our galaxy look like? Um, uh, what, it, what do Native nations look like that, that need to get beyond what they look like right now? Uh, I like to go there and let my mind wander about um, that, that future um, and imagine um, what my children will experience in that, in that world. So, so I turn to that way of thinking because I like it. I, I see the future. We're not erased. We're not invisible. We're, we're still there. Um, and we're doing some cool stuff. Um, maybe we're those skyboards. Um, Adrian and <laughs> Michaela are going to present on this tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. But the, the hopefulness, um, you have to remain hopeful. Uh, if you're taking on leadership positions, you have to, even when your hope gets de um, diminished and you're depleted, you've got to come back to, to, to finding hope. Um, and, and to me, also, the future is about rematriation. Um, and, and when I think about this, um, this is about how, how, it's not just fighting the patriarchy, but rematriation, what is it? It's, it's grounded in the sanctity of the land mm -hmm. and all of our connection as human beings on this planet, all of us, we need to get to a point where all of us are rematriated and we are centering ourselves back in the land. And right now, the land is telling us that it can't handle us anymore. So when I think of the future that's a little scary sometimes is like the human race is going to have to come together ar around this planet um, because it, it's, it's really, she's really hurting. And um, we don't know what's going to happen if we can't have water um, to begin with. Life, life is water for those water protectors that are out there um, fighting for, for our earth. So the rematriation is something I think that we all have to explore because we all came from peoples who believed in the sanctity of the land. It's just that our different cultures and people have forgotten those stories. So, so re, relearn your stories of your ties to the land. And that's how we're going to, I think, in the future, really come together as, um, as a, as human beings on this planet, not even as the United States, but as, as human, human beings. The last thing that I want to say in terms of students, um, uh, the scholars program that, that we run, that Michaela Crank is the director of, we've coined, um, we, we summed down into three words what we hope for our students, to be indigenous, educated, and unafraid. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's my hope for students. That's my hope for you is, is to take what you can from these institutions, um, call upon your ancestors, think to the future, and then go out and do it because you can. And remember um, that People put in hard work for us to be here in this space and that you're going to be creating the space for others to come. 20 years ago, as I was thinking about this conference, um, I, I uh, had the anthology Meet Us at the River um, that was created 20 years ago um, when I was a student here. And, and it's an important thing. And, and as I was looking at the anthology, I had scribbled some notes. And it was um, Cornell West must have spoken. I must have had that anthology, and I was scribbling things. And, and one of the things that I wrote down on, on that anthology, and I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it here with me to this space uh, because the AOCC came out of those students' movement uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but I put the quote down where he said, we change society by long marches in institutions mm -hmm. um, and that we must march through the institutions. So there was an, an, a more appropriate thing to say than to read that um, that I scribbled 20 years ago. So um, keep marching through. Mm -hmm. Diana. I feel like I want Carmen to have a podcast. <laughs> like, oh, I'm to you on my ride home. Uh, or we can do on all my relations too. Um, but I think um, 
One of the things that I'm really excited about that uh, I'm trying to think of like other things that you all had mentioned by, by this point, but is uh, the discipline of indigenous higher ed, right? Like mm -hmm. that's a growing area of research and, and no longer are we having to lean on students of color in higher ed, looking up those peer reviewed journals and trying to find where we're statistically significant in those spaces and all those reports decades ago. But um, we're finally taking those time, those those spaces back, and in, in, in peer review journals, we now have people coming through, uh, like Dr. Keen and um, uh, Robin Minthorn, and just like a bunch of different scholars who are now leading those spaces for us to read about ourselves from people who uh, from are from our communities. And so um, that's one area that I'm just really excited about, being that I'm still um, working through the beginning pieces of my career in, in higher ed, and. Um, I think that there's a lot of different potential that could happen and grow out of that. And I, I'm always kind of, I feel like I'm running myself out of a job because I'm always telling my, my students, I'm like, you could be a student affairs professional. Like, you're doing great. Like, they're just, they just do so much and they're so ambitious. And the students I've worked with, I'm just so impressed every day. Um, and I hope that they do, right? Because um, not a lot of people know that this is a, a career that you can go and pursue and no one knows that there's a master's in higher ed or a master's in student affairs. And so I'm always trying to tell people and tell my students like you can pursue this as a career if this is something that you feel really passionate about. Um, and I tell that to them and I feel like there's something that um, it, it, it kind of challenges, challenges them in a way because we're often hearing the message that you need to go back to your community. You need to go back, you need to give back. Either you need to uh, bring your degree back to help your people. And, um, but who's taking care of them when they're away? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, who's taking care of them when they're trying to get these degrees? And so, mm -hmm. and I feel like that was where I found my calling, um, is that I, I felt really comfortable in the, in the higher ed institution and in, in that I was supporting those students in those spaces who are going through the most important time in their lives trying to figure out who they're gonna be. Um, on a higher ed campus. So I think that those, those are some of the things that I'm really hopeful for and excited to continue to see. Um, the other one is, is, of course, like I mentioned earlier, and I think it was touched upon by um, one of the other speakers, was this idea of erasure, so like data erasure. And so uh, taking back that as a, as a topic of research for a lot of our, for our community. So Illuminatives is one that I'm always watching, if, you, if some of you have not heard of that. Um, Desi Rodriguez Lombert is, is also doing a lot of really good work with um, indigenous data sovereignty. And so I'm just, I'm so excited to see a lot of these new uh, spaces being created for us to kind of like follow along um, and making sure that we're, we're being um, taken into account in a lot of different reports and different ways like that. So, yeah. yeah. So to close us, um, I just want to give a very short story. Uh, we are storytellers. And um, around like my sixth week into being here at Hugsy, I was suffering from like imposter syndrome, like real bad. And um, I went to a ceremony that was being held on here uh, on campus um, led by Dr. Shawn Canoe. And um, one of the elders who was there, Elder Fred Kelly, who is also in Anishinaabe and a close friend of our family, um, was kind of, he could sense something was off with me. And I had a conversation with him about my place here and maybe this wasn't the right move and maybe I should just go home and um, you know he kind of he embraced me and held me by the shoulders and he looked you know deep into my eyes as elders often do and um, he told me uh, Heather my, my daughter you are sacred and um, I was I was very moved to, to tears in that moment um, and so I share that um, to remind everyone in this room that we are sacred beings and we come from such a long line of sacredness. And when it feels like these places don't honor that, we bring it anyway. We bring our ancestors with us and we make space for them. Yes. And um, just to never question your worth even even if it's put down on you so much and questioned so much by an institution. So I just want to share that as a final note and let's give a huge round of applause to all of you.
So thank you. All